Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. This message today is called The Blessing of Obedience. And it, you know, it's not easy to make, um, obedience is one of those tough words, isn't it? It's like when you hear that, you gotta obey. You know, I remember being a kid, and it was just, I just remember reading that scripture as a teenager going, obey your parents for the, in the Lord, for this is right. And, and I'm just like, man, it's such a tough thing to do. But I think a lot of times we don't focus on the blessings of obedience. You know, we, th- we focus on the burden of obedience, but there's a lot of blessing in obeying, and the Bible talks about it a lot. And I want to jump into James right away, James chapter one, that's going to be our, our main text for today. And we're going to look at what God says about not just being hearers of the word, but doers, so obedient doers of the word. And when someone comes to me and they ask, you know, how do I grow closer to God? How do I become that person God wants me to be? And how do I experience more of God? You know, one of the top three things I'm going to talk about is, right? One of them is, are you reading the word so you know God? And two, are you going to obey the word of God? Because God has set up a plan for you to grow and to experience him. But it's up to us whether we're going to obey that plan. And James 1, we're going to start, and I'm just going to walk through the scripture today together like I did last week. And by the way, next week, I'm excited about this. We're going to start a new series, and I'm going to fulfill a dream that God has put on my heart to do here at this church. And we're going to walk through the book of Ephesians together. The entire book. And I'm going to face the facts that i got to teach some things in there, Right? No skipping over anything. It's funny how we like to cherry pick scripture, isn't it? And, and today we're not going to cherry pick. We're going to do, we're going to preach the word of God. Okay. And the word of God says to obey, but I'm looking forward to it because the, the really, the, the purpose of Ephesians is to strengthen the church. How many know we need to be strengthened right now? So I'm looking forward to starting that series next week. It's going to be powerful. Invite your friends to watch. I don't care if they like church, don't like church, don't like you. I don't care. I mean, that might not help, but, you know, (laughs) invite everyone, invite people who like you, invite people who love you, because we're going to learn about God right away in the first chapter. And we want, we want to know God well and be strong in our understanding of God. And we want our, our neighbors and our friends to know God well too. Let me pray real quick. God, speak to us through your word. We humble ourselves to receive the truth of your word. And God, we know that you teach it and you have put it down for us to know because you love us. We thank you for that. Help us to apply it in Jesus' name, amen. James has been called um, a little bit like the Proverbs of the New Testament because James would just, he just jotted down all these wise things for us to know and out of nowhere he would change the subject. You know, he would say three, three lines and next thing you know he's on a whole different subject. And so it was like James was wanting to get as much information out as he possibly could for the church in this one letter. And so when you see how it jumps around a lot, that's why. And that's why scholars have nicknamed it the Proverbs of the New Testament. Because the book of Proverbs also changes subject uh, quite often. But in the scripture that we're going to read, it all connects. Luke, uh, I'm sorry, James uh, 1, 19, Luke will be later. 19 through 27, it all connects. But yet he talks about three different things in here. So let's go ahead and read it. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Wouldn't it be nice to go ahead and delete some of those words out of the Bible right now? Like, like I don't want to be angry. I don't want to have to stop being angry. No, God leaves it in there. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, the word God has planted in your hearts. It's talking about Jesus, talking about the gospel, talking about scripture. Humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. 
Now, James is writing this to a church that's spread out in many different cities and towns, and it could be that they're facing so much persecution that they're getting angry. And that's why James talks about in the first four, vo- four verses, well, I'll try to say that three times fast. He says that you're going to go through trials and to persevere and to endure. And when you do, you will be made complete and whole. So he's talking to a church that's struggling a little bit to, you know, not get angry. And he's saying, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And that human anger doesn't actually produce the righteousness that God is looking for in us. But what does he say? He says, get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. But how would you do that? Because we can get rid of filth and evil in our lives. We can deny it. But do we have the power to keep denying it? No. What do we do? We tend to give right back into it. So here's the thing about God. God won't ask you to stop doing something without replacing it to help you do it. He's not going to say, I need you to stop doing that and that's it. He's going to give you something to do instead. Why? Because our hearts are empty holes that need something. And so he says here in the next verse, humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. Why? Because it has the power to save your souls. If there's a reason to listen to the word of God every Sunday or read it every day, I think that's a good reason. The word of God has the power to save your soul and your neighbor's soul and your kid's soul. Praise God for that. So right away we see that James is saying, be good listeners. Be really good listeners. Like slow to speak. And slow to get angry. And there's another thing here. It's not just getting angry with people. It also means here to be slow to speak wrongly towards God or of God. So listen well to the word of God so you don't misrepresent God. And and especially misrepresent God in our anger. Now here's the thing. Um, Sometimes we'll think that if we stop doing things, we're good. But that's not what we see here in this verse. What saves our souls is the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus. Just so you know, when you read the word and it's capitalized, many times it's referring to Jesus because Jesus says, I am the word in John 1, 1, in John 1, chapter 1. So I want us to understand something, that not doing sin isn't the end game for us as Christians. Like, that's just good moralism, okay? What God wants is, God wants to come into your life, and he wants to help you live a righteous life that you could never live without him. And so when we preach the gospel and we can hear it, that's the first part. The gospel can be planted in our hearts, but it says here in in this verse, humbly accept what's been planted in your heart. Ooh, so there's some responsibility, isn't there? If there's some responsibility when we come to church or we're reading our Bibles, wherever you read them during the week, there's a responsibility to accept what you're reading, accept what the pastor is saying, but more importantly, what the word of God is saying. It's in that moment where we believe and accept it that there's one more choice. Do it. Obey it. So James goes, but don't just listen. So let's go to verse 22. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. But I don't want to do what it says because it says to do hard stuff. It says to forgive and love my enemies. Well, that's, that's going to be tough, isn't it? That's going to be hard. It says to apologize and to humble ourselves. It says to, to love. It says, it says a lot of good things to do too, though, church. I think a lot of times we hang on all the things we have to stop doing, and there's a lot of good things that God wants us to do. And by the way, God is going to judge us not just on the sins that we commit, but the things we do not do, he's asked us to do. It's called commission and omission. The things we neglected to do and the things that we did do that wasn't right. So God's looking at, are we, are we active in doing what he's asked us to do because that's really what's going to change the atmosphere. For instance, the Bible says, do not worry, right? Well, guess what? 
we got to do the next part where it says to pray and give thanks to God and then the peace of God will guard our hearts because he knows that the rest of that day you're probably going to get attacked. So you need a shield and a guard and a helmet over your head. Looking forward to getting to that in Ephesians. Now I'm getting excited about just a few verses and we got so much to do. You better pray for me that I hurry up and get off the stage. <laughs> My goodness, just joking with you. Don't just listen to God's word. You must, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. Don't we do that? Don't we go, man, that was a good message. That was a good scripture I read today. We're only fooling ourselves, though, if we don't do what it says. We're only missing out on the blessings if we don't do what it says. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, meaning love God, love others, the commandments that Jesus said, that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Wow. So in other words, if we're intent to remember what we read, if I'm looking in the mirror, I'm just like, I'm just like haphazardly looking to see if, my, if I'm okay and ready to go. Or do I intently look in the mirror and go, do I, is my hair sticking up? All right, I put deodorant on, thank God. By the way, I haven't got my, my sense of smell back yet or taste. There's some advantages and some disadvantages to that. So I have to like double check my checklist, you know? Did I put deodorant on? Anyway, I'm in front of the mirror. Do I remember what I see when I read the, the Bible? And do I have the intent to remember it when I read it? What am I trying to say? What is James trying to say? He's trying to say, go into the scripture, go into a sermon, go into a church with the intention of actually doing what you hear. To remember what you hear. Why? So that you can actually go and do it. To go live it out. By the way, if you read this again, if you look, verse 25 but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, that's a good argument for memorizing scripture. Don't forget what you heard. Uh, little three by five cards, write down scripture verses, put them on, in your car, and, and every time before you go into work, after you park, I didn't say when you drive, okay? <laughs> Just gotta make sure everyone knows that. But before you go into work or when you get home, Read that scripture verse. Memorize it by the end of the week. Scripture memory. It's a, it's a call for that. Then here's the, here's the result of obeying God. How many of you want to be blessed? What if I told you that the secret to blessing and experiencing more of God isn't more reading the Bible, it's obeying it? Well, it says it right here. Then God will bless you for doing it. And I'm going to give you some examples of our blessings at the end. Now, James, he's no joke. This dude, God spoke through James, through the Holy Spirit, and helped James write this. God gave the words to write. This is what we believe in this Bible. The Word of God is inspired by God, breathed by God, through the Holy Spirit, written through the apostles. So this is God, but James was listening really well. And James... He's the half-brother of Jesus, so he's been pretty close to Jesus. And he's heard Jesus' sermons. And so he says something that reminds me a lot of Jesus. But it's also God and Jesus working through the word, right? Well, verse 26 says, if you claim, this is like a measuring rod of whether we're obeying or not. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is... Ouch, worthless. And then you can also include these too. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So what do we have here? We have three things that we should be doing, but if we don't, then we don't really have true faith and righteousness in us. And now, does that mean that we're perfect? No. Sometimes this is a measurement for where we need to grow as a Christian, okay? 
But if someone lives like this all the time, there's definitely either some growing that needs to happen or maybe the word of God is not planted in your hearts and you have not been saved yet. Because he says here, here's some measurement. Uh, be careful with your tongue. Because if, if you don't, your religion is worthless. Take care of those who are needy. It's not just orphans and widows. It's anyone in need. The, the homeless, the hurting, the people who are neglected. In other words, do we show compassion to those who need it? First John talks a lot about that. And then lastly, he says, don't just control your tongue. Don't just uh, uh, make sure that you are taking care of those, the least of these, as Jesus would say, but make sure you're not letting this world corrupt you. Now, we can look at that and go, okay, I need to stop sinning. But you ready for this? How many, don't raise your hand. This, this year has been very tough. Have we let the depression of our world and struggles corrupt us from keeping us from praising God? So it's not just the wrong thing, so to say, like the, the blatant sin of don't let the world corrupt you, but is the negativity of this world keeping you from praising and remembering how good God is? We got to be careful of that too. But has it been a tough year? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank God for the book of Psalms. Can I get an amen? amen? David had some tough years, and you can see him venting to God over and over again. So God, is, God understands. He knows how weak we are. He knows that we're going to complain. He knows that we're going to struggle. So his word covers that too. And of course, we got to read it so we are aware of it. Now, Jesus also says some things that are pretty tough as well. And I want to go to John 8, 31. Because obedience is also proof of our genuine faith in God. In other words, if we believe God, we will do what his word says. In John 8, 31, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. So if you obey and practice my teaching, you are truly my disciples. But I want you to look at a key word in there. Notice in the beginning of that sentence, it says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him. Well, wait a second. I thought, I thought if you believe, that's good enough. Well, even demons believe in that, James goes on to say. Even demons believe that, that God is real. I mean, why is it that demons started manifesting every time Jesus came around? Why did demons praise God before sometimes the people of God did? Because they believe he's real. Like they would actually not praise God, but they would acknowledge Jesus. Sorry. They would go, you are the son of God. You are the son of God. And he would have to tell the demons to shut up because they were revealing his identity too soon. Even demons believe, but true disciples live like Jesus. True disciples trust and believe Jesus so much that they do what he says. And just in case you feel like you can't do it, the word of God planted in you gives you the power to do it. So he's like, hey, I'm not leaving you by yourself. I'm going to be with you to do what I've asked you to do. It's like Jesus gets rid of all of our excuses. We got the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the church to encourage us. It just comes down to whether we want to do it or not, whether we want to believe him or not and do it. Now, James goes on in chapter 2 and talks about an example of this with Abraham's faith. He says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. So Abraham went beyond believing and he started obeying God. And this is what it says, Verse 24, key verse. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. So James must have been listening to Jesus because it's not just those who believe, but those who obey my teaching. 
God hit me with something this week. Sometimes I got to sit back and I just got to be creative and think and just let the scripture sink in. And I realized something. I think there's something between listening and doing and it's believing. Now, let me explain. I can listen to something and acknowledge it's good advice, but do I believe it enough to actually go do it? Like, I don't, I don't like going to the doctor. He knows it all. Such a know-it-all. He knows how much, how, what I need to do to get better, healthier. Ah, the dentist, I really don't like the dentist. God bless you, by the way, if you're in the dental field. I couldn't be in people's mouths all day. It's just crazy. It's scary, by the way, when you hear those drills. You're laying there waiting. You're like, is that going to be me next? You know. Around this time, two years ago, um, I was pretty depressed. I was pretty feeling hopeless. My health was decaying, and I was 35. And I was like, yikes. My, my back was in pain. I had plantar fasciitis. By the way, my um, sciatic nerve, I had to ice it like two times a day. No one knew this because I was, you know, I'm I'm happy guy. I overcome everything in this world with the joy of the Lord. Amen. But I was ignoring my own health in the process. And God convicted me one day. And he didn't convict me through someone's mean comment. He got a hold of me one day when I was reading the Bible about basically just serve him with my whole life, including my health. Well, my friends keep posting those annoying pictures of them, you know, getting healthier and losing all this weight. I'm so awesome. I'm losing all this weight. <laughs> Don't you hate that? Uh, you know. Well, I'm, I can't do that. That's not me. That's not my life. Well, fast forward to May, and I was pretty pretty bad. My, my blood pressure was 176 over 97. I had migraines every day. It was only by the grace of God I was working and serving here. But it was around that time where I knew this is God. I say this not to make anyone feel bad or to puff me up. I'm just saying that this is God. Because the church asked me and other pastors on staff if I would apply for the lead pastor position. The amount of stress that I've been through in the past year and a half, if I had not gotten healthier, it could have killed me. And when my friends presented the plan to me, I was like, yeah, sounds great, not doing it. But then, come May, my wife kept bugging me, hey, maybe we should just at least ask. Isn't that a good wife? <laughs> Get behind me. You know, like, so I asked. And I talked to this guy on the phone for an hour. And I said, man, I got nowhere else to turn right now. I need a plan for dummies, because I'm a dummy on this stuff. Show me the way, bro. I'll invest in my health. He told me, he's like, you got to invest in your health. And he's right. I invest in everything else but my health. And so I did. Now, here's the thing. When that, that plan arrived to my front door, I could either apply it, or just go, this is a good plan. <laughs> All right, why isn't it working? Let me take the book he gave me, deposit it, transfer the information, work. No, I ha you, you guys get the point. I had to do what the plan says. And as soon as I did, I began to feel different and see results. My plantar fasciitis went away. My sciatic nerve pain went away. Poor John Burak at Synergy, he never saw me anymore. At Synergy Chiropractic, he never, I was, in, I was in John's office all the time, getting my back cracked and everything, getting advice from him. And now he never sees me because my back is better. I lost 70 pounds. My migraines went away. My blood pressure is back to normal because I followed the plan. Do, you, do we realize that God has already given us a plan that would change our lives and the people around us? But we have to obey what we believe to be true. Amen? We have to walk out the word of God. God's word is the manual for us. And the only 
the only thing stopping us from experiencing the power of God and the word, the power of the word is obeying it. And yes, it is the hardest part. It is the hardest part sometimes of being a Christian is to obey the word of God. It really is, but yet it comes with the benefits at the same time. And lastly, the last thing Jesus says is obedience is proof of our genuine love for God. Now, this one might hurt. It hurts, but it's good. This is Jesus. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. John 14, 15. If you love me, obey my commands. John 14, 23 through 24. All who love me will do what I say. My father will love them. And we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. John 15, 10, when you obey my commands, you remain in my love. How many want God's love? You can raise your hand for that, right? Amen. Just as, I'm, as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. Wow, we get to re, the result of obeying God is we get to experience God's love firsthand. And by the way, look at this. This is Jesus talking. Look what it says, just as I obey. When I read that this week, I was like, well, if Jesus has to obey, I got to obey. Well, I don't get an excuse. But this is what I love about God. Because while I look at God as, as my Lord and my master, and I actually really do enjoy obeying God out of a servant relationship. Okay, I really do. I like that. Like, I love to serve God with my life. Like, I'll obey God as a servant. But he doesn't stop there. What we're reading in this scripture and in John 15 is that we love, we obey out of love too. Because God first loved us, we can love. God's love enables you to love him back. God's love. In other words, the more you obey God, the more you fall in love with him. It's the same thing in marriage. The more we love each other, the closer we get. There's so many life principles attached to this. So let me finish with this. What are the blessings of obedience? Well, we get to see and experience God firsthand. I read somewhere recently that we don't truly know the commandments until we live them. We don't truly learn a commandment until we actually live them. It's so true. That's why I loved science class. Because you got to experiment your theories. Your, your, you know, you had a hypothesis. I, I think that if I do this and this, this room will blow up. Let's go try it, you know. And there were some scary moments, by the way. But if I go in a, and get to experience it, I'm going to enjoy that. And that's what we get to experience. And it is clear in Scripture that, oh, I'm going to just read it for you. I'm going to read it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 15. We're going there. John 15. It says this. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments, remain in his love. That was verse 10. Verse 11. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Wait. God told us to remain in his love by obeying him. By the way, we get to a place where we do it because we do love him, right? It's not a duty anymore. It's out of an overflow of a loving relationship with him. The result is joy. Could we use some joy in our world right now? Well, who would have known that the result of obeying would bring joy? Well, I have noticed that when I'm in conflict with God, I am not at peace and there's definitely no joy. But when I'm doing what God says, when God says to do this thing and I go and do it, whew, there's a weight lifted off your shoulder. There's a peace and a joy that just rises up. How many of you regretted not doing what God asked you to do? You live the rest of that week going, man, I should have helped that person out. I knew I was supposed to help that person out. Another thing is we grow spiritually strong and mature. Another blessing. A lot of people ask, how do I grow closer to God? Well, I heard this said one time, knowledge without application is useless information. Knowledge 
without application is useless information. We don't see the power of knowledge until we apply it. Spiritual growth is accomplished by what we apply. We grow and mature when we obey the Bible and do what it says. A lot of people think, and I was, the, I was one of these, a lot of people think that if we read more of the Bible, we will grow closer to God. That's actually not true according to what we're learning today. I could, we could be, some of us could be more spiritually mature because we actually apply what we're reading. Like for instance, what if I read 360 pages, you read 60, and you grow more than me? And what's the, the defining factor? You apply to 60 pages. And I'm like, man, why come I'm not growing? Why come this isn't working? Because I didn't apply the first 60. It's just logic. God's a logical God. And I, I appreciate that. And lastly, another blessing of obedience isn't just what we experience. It's not just spiritual growth and, what, and how we experience God. But when we obey, we bless others. Other people experience the blessing of God through our obedience. I thank God for a mom and dad that obeyed God. It doesn't mean that if your parents didn't, it doesn't mean you can't start. The word of God playing in you will save your soul and you will start being a blessing to people around you. Praise God. Be encouraged today. I was fortunate to have amazing parents who obeyed God. Thank God that, that I can pass down things to my kids. I want my kids to experience the blessings of God, the benefits, but I'm going to have to obey the word of God. Today in this room, we are enjoying the benefits of people's obedience. Because over 60 years ago, a little woman, in her time of prayer and the word, God told her to start a Bible study. And she started in her kitchen, and 60 years later, we're still here because of it. Thank God she said yes to God. Thank God. The reason why we're here is because for over 60 years, people have served. They said yes to serving. People have given. They said yes to give. People have shared the gospel. They said yes to telling people about Jesus. People have invited people. They said yes. We have technology because volunteers showed up. You, small, you saw smiling faces when you came in. We have kids being taken care of in the nursery and the kids' church because someone said yes to the word of God. And you said yes to following God, and that's why you're here today. And you're hearing a message that could change the trajectory of your life and those who come in contact with you today. Who knows? Who can even fathom the fruit of this message today? Only God. Only God is going to see what takes place because we obey the word of God. Only he will see it. We'll see it in the future in heaven. And by the way, that's another benefit to obeying God as we will see him one day. Because Jesus said, believe, but obey as well, my teachings. So the challenge that we have is when we are good hearers, let's, so let's be really good hearers, really good listeners of the word. Let's believe the word is true, but we still have one more important choice left. And that choice is to do what it says or disobey it or not do what it says. And what we choose determines what we experience here on earth and in eternal life. So close your eyes. I'm going to close this in prayer. Man, God is good today. He, he's good every day. But man, God is moving today. I'm going to ask you a really important question. What has God been asking you to do? God, what have you been asking me to do? What is your word telling me to do?
Is it let go? Forgive, apologize, help someone in need, start a prayer group or a Bible study or reach out to a neighbor you haven't seen. What has God been saying to you? When you're reading the Bible, what is he saying to you? When you come to church, what is he whispering to you to do? Church, enjoy, enjoy the blessing of obeying that command. It's going to be beautiful to see what he does. Trust his voice too. If it's in his word, it's, it's spot on. Trust his leading. God, we thank you for this word today. We need it. Lord, give us the courage and the faith to trust your word so that we will obey it. And God, we give you the results. The results are up to you. You've called us to obey, not to fix the results. That's up to you. So God, we do our part and you do your part. And we're, we're blessed and people around us are blessed. I thank you, God, once again, for a father and a mother who said yes to you, a grandmother who told them about Jesus grandmothers who, and fathers who poured into my parents, the people who poured into them. I thank you, God, that someone said yes to share the gospel with my family. And because of that, I'm here. And God, I thank you for calling me. Thank you for calling this church and everyone in this place. God, you have a plan and a purpose, and we want to see it unfold in our lives. And so we will be careful to obey, to trust and obey everything you say. In Jesus' name. Amen.